To those who can hear it, the sound means death. America is on the brink of annihilation. An invading army is at the doorstep of one of the country's largest cities. Its capital has been ravaged, its defenses shattered. Only one thing stands between the enemy force and the nation's destruction. The will of 15,000 men and women determined to defeat America's first invasion. September 10, 1814. Just two weeks earlier, Washington was decimated, its army virtually non-existent. The destruction of Washington has spread fear over the Chesapeake Bay, especially in Baltimore, a city the London Times calls a nest of pirates. And it's from here that the privateers, those little sailing ships, have gone out to seize British ships so that the captains and the crew can uh, get the prize money. And that's why this city is deliberately targeted by the British. Baltimore had seen violent anti-war demonstrations two years earlier, but now the city finally galvanizes and prepares for an attack. George Douglas, a local merchant, expresses the view of many. The horrible mismanagement at Washington has taught us a useful lesson, and we must be worse than stupid if we do not make proper use of it. The city's leaders appoint Samuel Smith, a Revolutionary War veteran and the Major General of the Maryland Militia, to lead Baltimore's defenses. Sam Smith's in an interesting position. His job is to grab them by the lapels and to shake them out of that sense of dread and that sense of doom and that sense of defeat and to challenge them to believe enough in themselves and in their neighbors that this is our time. This is America's time. This is Baltimore's moment to step up. This is either our beginning or our end as a country. Smith's appointment ignites yet another dispute. To William Winder, the hapless commander of Washington, Smith represents a more direct threat to his authority than the British. But Smith wants to avoid another disaster. And that means Winder must go. Winder being a regular officer, now knowing that he's being usurped by a militia officer, naturally becomes incensed. But Sam Smith is not one to be easily trifled with. And so when Winder begins to protest, to cut to the chase, Smith says, I'm telling you how the cabbage gets chewed. And at that point, there's its done deal. With Winder out of the way, Smith takes advantage of the British Army's slow advance to rally the entire city and bolster Baltimore's defenses. Merchant George Douglas notes the city's dramatic transformation. At least a mile of entrenchments with suitable batteries were raised as if by magic, at which are now working all sorts of people, old and young, white and black. They worked together, building the earthworks, protecting their livelihood. They knew at the last minute what they faced if the British took over their city. The responsibility of galvanizing the American military presence falls to a young commander, Major George Armistead. He already knows what will be the target of a naval attack, Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. Major George Armistead, 38 years old, artillery officer. Armistead is ordered to Fort McHenry by the Secretary of War. Fort McHenry guards the entrance to the city of Baltimore. This is the key defense, and this is a vital role for Armistead to take command, and he loses no time in making defense preparations. Those efforts now include turning to the people of Baltimore once again, and asking them to make the supreme sacrifice for their city. Think about the merchants of Baltimore. They were willing to sink their own ships, their livelihood 
to protect the harbor of Baltimore. With these sunken hulks in the harbor, the British warships could not get any closer. They created a man-made reef that protected the rest of the city. Armistead immediately orders two tiers of earthen shore batteries built and the mounting of 60 artillery pieces. We are ready, except that we have no suitable ensign to display over the fort. And it is my desire to have a flag so large that the British will have no difficulty in seeing it from a distance. Armistead sends an order for a large garrison flag and a smaller banner known as a storm flag to Mary Pickersgill, a maker of colors in Baltimore. The War Department pays her $574.44 for the two flags. The larger one, made of light wool bunting, measures 30 feet by 42 feet. This was one very large flag. It took more than Mary Pickersgill to pull this off. There were seven women living in that house with her, and her daughter Caroline relates this story in a letter she writes. The flag is so very large. My mother was obliged to obtain permission from the proprietors at the Claggarts Brewery to spread in their malt house. And I remember seeing my mother down on the floor placing the stars. My mother worked many nights until 12 o'clock to complete it in the given time. Soldiers hoist the new stars and stripes over Fort McHenry, capping the defensive preparations of Baltimore. As the largest flag in the country, it satisfies Major Armistead's order. The British will have no difficulty in seeing it. By 10 o'clock p.m. on September 10th, the city settles in. The entire area shrouded in an eerie silence. Everyone in Baltimore is aware of what is at stake. Now, the only thing they can do is wait. At noon, an alarm cannon blasts a warning to the city, shattering the quiet of a Sunday afternoon. Lookouts have sighted the British fleet off North Point. Some citizens respond in panic. Others rush to defend the city. The attack on Baltimore calls for a combined land and sea assault. By 7 a.m. the next morning, as 50 naval ships head up the Chesapeake, 4,000 British infantry troops and Royal Marines form at North Point and begin their march to Baltimore. Marching in the hot, humid conditions of a Chesapeake Bay summer would be hard enough as it is, but marching in a woolen uniform with uh, equipment, musket, 60 rounds of lead balls, haversack, knapsack, water canteen, was absolutely draining to the soldiers. A number of them died by the side of the road. Undaunted, British Commander Major General Robert Ross, flush from his overwhelming victory at Bladensburg and the burning of Washington, presses on. When informed that militia make up the majority of American troops, he declares, I don't care if it rains, militia. He will soon regret those words. This time, Ross will face off against American General John Stricker, a leader with a very different attitude than his colleagues in Washington. Stricker is determined that this time the militia won't run like sheep chased by dogs as they had outside the capital. Outnumbered, outgunned, and knowing that they are now facing the best army in the world, Stricker instead gives his men a different order. Attack. 